edition of the History Podcast today, and we have today a super guest. If you don't know this guy, you're not in the industry. Today, we're going to talk with Daniel Herring, the History Doctor. First of all, how are you, Dan? Or should I say, how are you, History Doctor? I am fantastic, as always. Thank you. And, you know, uh, we're the History Podcast, and you're the History Doctor, so I believe we have a bunch of uh, stuff to talk about. I'm super excited to, to have you here on the show. I can tell that I can tell the audience that Dan has a very, very busy, busy agenda, but we were able to fit this today. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. You know, all, all the all, all the wisdom, all, all the experience and all the knowledge that Daniel is going to share uh, with, with us today. I, I think it's going to be very valuable. So what are we going to talk about today? You know, the future needs of captain and commercial heat treat. I believe that's very interesting. Uh, he's going to tell us his perspective, what he think, his opinion on where the market is going to go. Uh, the role of induction vacuum and atmosphere, you know, because right now things are very dynamic. Things are changing. There's a, a bunch of emerging markets. But of course, there's going to be always a place for induction vacuum and atmosphere. We're going to hear it from Dan, right? Uh, of course, uh, I would love to uh, ask Dan about his uh, approach or method of analysis of, of uh, when dealing with situations. He gets a bunch of calls from different uh, heat treaters or from different companies that have an issue with heat treat because he, he, he does a lot of consultancy. And of course, uh, ask him about uh, what's a day to day, uh, day to day of the heat treat doctor. So super excited to have you here, Daniel. But first of all, who, uh, for the people that are not very familiar with the history doctor, with Daniel Harry, can you just share with us a uh, very general uh, of, of your career, your background, and what you do? Sure, I'd be more than, more than happy, more than happy to. Uh, essentially, I started out in life as a uh, young student, as they say, who uh, uh, thought he was uh, semi-intelligent anyway. Uh, seemed to breeze through uh, university and enjoy myself. But my father was a machinist. So my father was a very practical, skilled man. And interestingly enough, my next door neighbor was some strange individual called a heat treater. So my father and my next door neighbor would have many conversations together in the evening. Now, truth be told, and I, I guess I could admit this at my age, but I was probably more interested in his daughter at that moment in time than I okay. was the conversations going on about heat treating and, and machining and metallurgy and things of this nature. But um, I really was interested in chemistry as a young man. And uh, of course, uh, metallurgy can be defined in very simple terms as the chemistry of metals or the chemistry of materials. So it fit very well into my interest and in my personality. Uh, basically what I wanted to do was get my hands dirty. Uh, I can say this, uh, which would not happen today in, in most uh, industrial facilities, but I've been in machine shops since I've been six years old. Uh, today, the uh, OSHA and the uh, uh, <laughs> a number of other agencies would never allow a, uh, a young person to be in a shop at that age. But uh, I learned early on the sights, the sounds, the smells of manufacturing. And that's something that as I went through school and I went through the university, that always stuck with me. I wanted to deal with the practical side of the science. Uh, yes, the, the theoretical side is important and interesting, but the practical side um, is a world onto itself. So that's how I got started. I, uh, due to my father, due to one of my next door neighbors, um, uh, it became just a, a life's passion, if you will. Now, why heat treating? I, uh, you know, I get the idea that you love manufacturing and science about it, but you know, heat treat is one of those special processes, but there's always, uh, you know, casting, some forging and machining and some, you know, some, some other uh, disciplines of, of manufacturing. Why heat, heat treat itself? Because of your, of, of your uh, neighbor's daughter? Well, <laughs> had something to do with it. Unfortunately, that relationship didn't go anywhere, by the way, but we'll ignore that. 
Uh, but no, one of the things that was interesting was that when I finally left or graduated the university, um, I happened to get a job working at Lindbergh, okay. which was the same company that my neighbor worked at. In fact, my neighbor was instrumental in getting me a job. Now, Lindbergh had two areas. There was the commercial heat treat that ultimately was purchased by Body, body Coat. Code, right. And there was the furnace division. And I worked in the furnace division. Uh, the two companies were separated at that time. It was Lindbergh, the heat treater, and Lindbergh Engineering Company, the furnace manufacturer. So my interest in metallurgy, my interest in thermodynamics, my interest in practical hands-on science, all led me to work in an industry that made furnaces, uh, atmosphere furnaces, vacuum furnaces, ovens, induction equipment. Uh, Lindbergh in those days in the early 1970s made it all and did it all, if you will. So you started as a furnace engineer? I, I'm sorry, I started as a what? As a furnace engineer. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I basically worked in, uh, uh, Lindbergh had a research and development laboratory in those okay. days. And when I say that, they had 11 full-size furnaces that we ran three shifts a day. So uh, when I started out, uh, in fact, you might find this to be a humorous story. I think your listeners will. But my very first day on the job, the chief metallurgist who I reported to said, son, go over there and repipe that nitriding furnace. And so I stuffed all my degrees and advanced degrees in my back pocket. And as I'm repiping this furnace, I'm thanking God that uh, my father taught me which end of a pipe wrench to use. Uh, but I started out uh, in the R&D lab, but like I said, they had 11 full-size furnaces. As soon as I was taught um, uh, how each furnace ran, I was promoted to third shift, and I ran the third shift for a while, long while. I then was promoted to second shift, and finally, uh, uh, finally got on first shift. Uh, so I can empathize, if you will, not only with people working on the first shift, but people working on the second and working on the third shift. And I understand some of the pressures and I understand some of the responsibilities that the operators and the supervisors have to take. Uh, not having engineering or management or, or a, a large staff on hand when they're operating on second or third shift. And this has is, is worked very well for me when I do heat treat training and educational programs. I can relate very much to fellows in the second shift and the third shift. And uh, so my career has been very diversified, if you will, by um, working on different, uh, different shifts and also as a problem solver. Uh, and this, again, led to my career as the heat treat doctor. But in the early days, the rule was, if you broke it, you fixed it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, when you did something uh, wrong and a furnace broke down, it was your responsibility to help fix it. So you learn certain skills like pipe fitting and welding and uh but you learn the furnaces, what I call the brick and steel of the furnaces, if you will, how they're constructed, how they work, how they're supposed to work, how you modify or change them to make them work better. So as a result of that, I think it was being extremely well grounded in my career, especially in the first five years of having very, very practical training, practical hands-on skills that led me to uh, become the engineer uh, I ultimately became. But, uh, just uh, uh, help me close the gap because I can relate to, to your story 
because uh, I, I also uh, manufacture furnaces and I like to think about myself as a furnace engineer, but the, uh, you know, the experience that you get from building furnaces or repairing broken furnaces, as you said it, steel and brick, is totally different from uh, running parts. Uh, and, and I got that also on, on when, when I became uh, also uh, a manager for the heat treat shop. So I'm, I, I do build furnaces and I, I, I run a couple of commercial heat treats. They're very, two, the very different disciplines, uh, very different animals. When a, a, furnace, is, a furnace breaks down, uh, the piping, the burners, the mechanics, it's totally different when you're dealing with distortion, with uh, IGO, uh, with, with uh, uh, dark spots. So you learn your skills on Lindbergh as a furnace engineer. But when Dan Herring became a, a, a material engineer and a specialist on processes, on heat well, processes, on, on application itself. Sure, absolutely. And, and it starts with the realization that this R&D lab was far more than an R&D lab. I mean, we did commercial heat treat work in those days. And to define it a little bit, irrespective of your degrees and training, I started off loading baskets, mm -hmm. designing process recipes, analyzing parts, rerunning cycles. If, for example, something went wrong, having to explain to the machine shop why I cracked their dies because I ran the wrong cycle. Uh, learning furnace atmospheres uh, directly, if you will, carbon potentials, mm -hmm. nitriding potentials, things of this nature. So when I say that I was involved in third shift and second shift and first shift, this was really hands-on work. So mm -hmm. process and equipment were married together in my uh, career base. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't separate the two. Uh, I learned how to uh, run a process, run a or design a process, run a furnace, analyze parts, rerun a uh, rerun the parts if necessary, fix the furnace if it broke down, and then what ultimately led to me becoming the heat treat doctor was the fact that as my skills grew, the company's interest in sending me out into the field to help customers solve field problems was invaluable. And I spent about 15 years uh, traveling up to 15 days a, a month, working with customers and solving problems. I was even on a, a and I don't want to make this podcast all about myself, but I was even on a rapid response team. If a customer had a, a fire or an emergency or a furnace explosion, we would go out and we would analyze what happened and, and issue corrective actions and help customers resolve difficulties. So very early on, I was able to apply my skill set to problem solving uh, out in the field, in the real world, and, and it was invaluable. I, I believe you got the, uh, the best university and the best education, you know, building a furnace, running R&D uh, with real processes, loading baskets and running recipes, but having the ability to fix the furnaces or, or see what, uh, what process variables have to change on the furnace itself. And then going on the field to different companies with different applications, with different furnaces, with different parts, that gives you a, a very wide range of, uh, of knowledge, right? So uh, that, that answers uh, a bunch of questions I had, why you become such an expert on the subject, but you, you had it all, you know, building furnaces, running R&D, visiting places, uh, troubleshootings, and uh, you didn't learn from your mistakes. You, did, you learned from the problems others had at their facilities uh, by, by uh, solving them uh, and helping uh, people solve them. So. Thanks, thanks for sharing that background. I, I find it really interesting myself. But uh, now let's go uh, and, and to the technical subjects of today's podcast. Uh, because actually you suggested this, what I believe is, is, uh, is very worth uh, talking about because you had such a, a, a wide view of, of the industry on different process and different companies and, uh, and, and different geographies. But now 
What's going on today on the world of heat treating? Of course, we have atmosphere, we have vacuum, we have induction, right? But there's new emerging technologies like the electrical vehicle. Uh, we can talk about, about uh, you know, uh, uh, space travel or as, as tourism, additive manufacturing. So the, the technologies are, you know, uh, are, are moving on a dynamic way. But where do you think the role of those technologies, induction, vacuum, atmosphere, we can talk about uh, oil quench, cell quench, uh, where they're going to go? What, uh, what, what are you seeing the world right now, especially now with COVID and all the supply chain uh, slowing down, but, and also the, the, the emerging technologies? And where will heat be, let's say, in 10, 20 years as today things is evolving? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. And I think, think something worth, uh, uh, we could spend the entire podcast talking about it, but I'll try. I don't, I don't mind, you know, we have time. Uh, we do, but I'll uh, I'll try to be brief. But one of the things that I realize, uh, uh, or I realized and have seen come out of the world today, is that we had fallen into a sense of being a uh, very globally connected in terms of the supply chain, and uh, in various countries in various areas we were becoming lax, if you will, in our manufacturing capability. I know this is very true in the States. The idea being the fact that we forgot a fundamental rule, and that is that manufacturing is a core competency. It's at the heart of what we do. So one of the things that this global pandemic, as horrific as it is, one of the things that this global pandemic has taught every country in the world is that they have to become more self-reliant. They have to have basic manufacturing capabilities in all industries, whether it be uh, basic steel, all the way through electronic semiconductors and, and uh, products such as that. So as a result of that, we, yes, we're still tied in with a global economy, but we realize that we have to have self-sufficient capability. And what this is going to fuel and what this is fueling, our people are rethinking their manufacturing uh, base, if you will, uh, their core competency. So as a result of that, you're seeing countries invest more in the development and the production of their own products. And having enough products, obviously, to sell to other countries, it's, um, uh, it's called economics. But the idea being, uh, the idea behind this being that uh, we are going to see in the next 10 years a slow but steady growth in the manufacturing side of the economy. Uh, let me give you a few numbers, uh, not that they're, they're all that relevant today, but you've probably heard of the GDP, the gross domestic product. Most heat treat engineers don't pay any attention to it, nor should we. Uh, it's, three, it's three letters that we don't like to hear. But uh, believe it or not, at the end of World War II, the gross domestic the manufacturing portion of the gross domestic product of the United States was 38.4%, meaning most of what we did was manufacture goods. That has fallen or fell off to an all-time low in around 2008 of 11.4%. So of what we, we don't produce anymore, we become a service economy. So the idea is the fact that the, the GDP, the manufacturing portion of the GDP is growing. It's over almost 13% today. So as a result of that, we're manufacturing more goods and we have more of a need for something called heat treating. Now the form, and you, you've mentioned it, the form in which we're, we're doing things is changing. Uh, if you look at additive manufacturing as an example, it's a different type of heat treating that's involved. 
uh, you're either doing a kneeling and stress relieving operations or depending on the way in which uh, you're, you're putting on the additive layers, uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, debindering and you're dealing with sintering and they're looking at making, if you will, individual cells that companies would have a small manufacturing cells, which by the way, include furnaces in those manufacturing cells. So they can produce a complete uh, additive manufactured product, if you will. So in answer to your question, I think the, the, the good news is heat treating is going to grow, slow, steady growth from 2020, which is when it started all the way through 2030 and beyond, probably 2040 and beyond. But the idea being the fact that with this growth, you're going to see a change in technology. And part of the change is also due to two other factors. One is the change in the, what I'm going to call controls and sensors and electronics and things of this nature. You know, we're sitting in a, in a pandemic situation, but we're now putting smart sensors on furnaces that can relay information into the cloud. We can do cloud computing on those parameters and we can come back and we can tell um, people on the ground, if you will, exactly what's wrong with their furnace. You're going, the vibration of your, of your fan and your carburizing chamber has increased. We have to shut down for maintenance or we have to be aware of that. Your oil agitators or your oil movement is not, is not flowing at the proper rate. There's an obstruction, there's a problem. So smart sensors and smart technology is coming in a big way. I still remember I was in Europe for a symposium and a fellow was demonstrating uh, 3D vision goggles. The idea that he could put a, a 3D, a pair of 3D goggles on, the maintenance man would have a set of 3D goggles on in the field, be looking at something and the two of them could relate a problem without ever being together. So we could solve a problem in Argentina from a location in France or vice versa. So the idea here is that technology is changing. The way in which we operate heat treat furnaces is changing. The, the people that are interested in doing heat treating that are going to do heat treating in the future are going to have tools at their disposal like we've never had before. And I say that from a perspective, I'll give you a quick example. I'm, I come from the slide rule generation. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with a slide rule. By the way, for all heat treaters out there that don't know what a slide rule is. I, I don't know what it is. Think of it as a pre-computer, okay? okay? Or we had computers. Well, now we have computers. Now we have the internet. Now we have the cloud. You can see how in 50 years, the technology keeps advancing and moving forward. So what's, what's really exciting is it's not just that we're going to have atmosphere furnaces or vacuum furnaces or ovens or induction heating. We're going to have smart furnace technology. We're just like our, our heating and cooling systems in our home, our security systems in our home, Oh, we, can, uh, we can access them on a tablet or a, or a, a, a smartphone. Uh, we're going to be able to watch in real time what's happening with our heat treat furnaces anywhere at any time. And this revolution or evolution is maybe a better term, which is taking place in the industry is going to fuel tremendous growth but in a way that's a little bit unexpected. You know, many of the, many of the people ask me, well, uh, is atmosphere go furnaces going to disappear and all be dominated by vacuum furnaces or induction equipment? Is oven technology, is low temperature processing gonna dominate the landscape? 
is salt bath quenching out or in? Is it shrinking or is it growing? And by the way, it's growing. It is. Because of, because of distortion or what I like to say, uh, dimensional variation. Uh, but the fancy word for distortion. Yeah, it is. I'm going to start using it when, when I get some trouble with uh, on the heat rates. Well, and I have to compliment a gentleman from Timken years ago. We always talk, and I'm getting a little off subject here, but we always talk about distortion control. And he got up in a lecture and talked about managing distortion rather than trying to control distortion. And even though I heard that 20 or 25 years ago now, I've never, ever forgotten it. We can't control the uncontrolled, but we can manage it. We can minimize it. We can predict and actually in the real world, world force distortion to act in a way that's favorable to us. So anyway, the, the idea being the fact that all of the tools and all of the things that are happening with furnaces are going to spur an unprecedented level of growth. Now, atmosphere technology is going to take, in my mind, it's a dominant technology of today, but it's going to play less of a role going forward. Induction heating or applied energy, as it's called, uh, vacuum furnaces, even oven technology is going to play a greater role. It's not because atmosphere furnaces are inherently dangerous or inherently unsafe. They're not. But it's a situation where when we look at how heat treats are going to be run in the future, this idea of small batch processing, ideally one piece flow, is going to start to dominate the landscape. I'll give you a good example. When I first started in this industry in the late 1960s, early 1970s, there were two dominant types of atmosphere furnaces. There were pusher carburizers, which dominated the automotive landscape, and there were integral quench furnaces, which everybody, including automotive, owned and operated. Well, look at what's happened to the pusher furnace industry in the last three to four to five decades. Pusher furnaces have been replaced with multi-cell, continuous, so to speak, vacuum carburizing equipment. Pusher technology has been relegated to a much smaller role because we didn't need the massive volumes being produced from pusher carburizing furnaces or pusher hardening furnaces from that standpoint. We needed small batches to move quickly through the heat treat shop. So the landscape has changed. Oven technology has changed dynamically in the last 20 or 30 years. Ovens are becoming more like furnaces, my friend. They're, they're much more ruggedly built. They're designed for certain tasks. They dominate certain industries. Um, uh, the high temperature box furnace. You know, oven technology was, um, was originally relegated to under 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. or under. Then it became 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit and then 1,450 degrees Fahrenheit, and then 1,750 degrees Fahrenheit. So ovens are not your grandfather's old oven, if you will. They're modern technology, modern tools. So all of these changes are fueling the following in my mind. A shrinkage in, in the concentration of atmosphere furnaces, a growth in applied energy, a growth in vacuum, and niche markets such as ovens or salt bath technology. You wouldn't call oven technology a niche in the aluminum or aluminum industry, of course, but you, you see oven technology uh, certainly applying to a number of niche markets. So 
I look at it as that the mix is going to change the percentage of atmosphere furnaces versus vacuum versus induction, but the pie is going to become bigger. And as the pie gets bigger, there'll be a greater number of pieces of equipment. Um, one other thing you might find fascinating and, and the listeners might find absolutely amazing. But if I were to go back in a time capsule, back to the beginning of my career, I can say that the number of furnaces being purchased was astronomical. It was unusual to have a day go by where you didn't receive one or two or three orders for pusher furnaces, belt furnaces, integral quench furnaces, things of this nature. I remember an order being placed for stock in which we built 72 integral quench furnaces for stock and wound up selling all of those furnaces in a 18 month time frame, in addition to others. But the ones we sold from stock were, were sold at that or sold in that period of time. You fast forward to today, and we're hoping we get a couple of orders a month for furnaces. So the number of furnaces has changed, but the type has also changed. And we're seeing a growth in the number of furnaces, but the type and the size of the furnaces are changing as well. I, I, I got a, a, a question regarding that subject because uh, atmosphere furnaces, if you want to call it pushers, they can last forever if you will maintain them. And uh, the, the controls uh, can be easily upgrade uh, on such a percentage that does not represent buying uh, brand new furnaces. Pusher furnaces are massive um, uh, volume machines to process parts and are also very capital expense, ex expensive, right? There's big machines. Now, the question I have is that uh, I understand wh where the industry and the market is going, but of course, cost of process and capital expenditure also plays a role. New furnaces with new technology become more expensive, and there are already a lot of pusher furnaces well-maintained installed in the world, right? So if the economy is going to, you know, uh, Let's let's uh, let's process less stuff, you know, uh, uh, smaller smaller loads, but you have to buy a very expensive new furnace with all the technologies with these all IOTs. What's going to happen with the existing capacity? Are they going to scrap those pushers, or they're going to try? to upgrading is to grade the, the controllers and automate it in such a way that they don't have to buy a machine. Because if we were to think that companies like GM or Ford are going to stop using their pushers and they're going to buy a new machine, uh, while they have a machine that can uh, be upgraded and perform the same heat treat without uh, using the space and just upgrading the, the technology and adding sensors, will that make sense to you? It's a great question. And, and I think the way to answer it is the fact that you're not going to see technology, dis, uh, certain technologies disappear overnight. But I can say that technologies are changing. The idea is the fact that we're looking at, for a variety of reasons, we're looking at running smaller loads faster through pieces of equipment. Uh, among other reasons or ideas is, is quality and the quality control of the product being produced. And interestingly enough, the automotive manufacturers, whether they be, um, uh, as you mentioned, General Motors or Ford, whether they be Nissan, whether they be Toyota, whether they be Honda, I don't want to leave out any of the major first sure. manufacturers. Uh, I don't intend to do that. But the idea being the fact here that they're taking a hard look 
at, for example, the types of the types and volumes and capacities that they actually need, uh, especially in light of what might be a change in a fundamental change in the automotive industry. You've mentioned uh, electric vehicles. Um, uh, these are coming in the future. There's, there's obstacles and hurdles in the way, but they're, they're going to arrive. Uh, they're going to require different, different amounts, if you will, of heat-treated parts in the vehicles themselves. By the way, the infrastructure to support an electric vehicle is going to make up the capacity, in my mind, that's lost by, let's say, the number of gears and things in an electric vehicle. But the idea being the fact that it's already happening. People are looking at, in my mind anyway, people are looking at perfectly good pusher furnaces and saying, do I want to have that capacity? Can I fill that furnace? Can I keep it running 24 seven, you know, 365 days a year? Or like turning on and turning off the electric lights, do I want a solution that's instant on, instant off, and available on demand, if you will? So I do see the industry changing. I do see the industry moving away, not for everything. Uh, I'll give you another interesting fact that is becoming very apparent. Because in my career, I worked for three uh, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. I worked for Lindbergh. I worked for CI Hayes and I worked for Ibsen. Before I decided, I finally got smart and, and formed my own business about 25 years ago. But I worked for those good companies. And one of the things I, I know and I've seen is the fact that there's a constant struggle within those companies as to what type of products should we make? And what has come out of this is two diversely different approaches. One approach is to build standard equipment and to try to fit everything into a standard product line. The other is diametrically opposed to that is designing custom equipment, one of a kind or special application furnaces. There may be hundreds or thousands of them. Like we're looking at special furnaces designed for the additive manufacturing world. There may be thousands. In fact, there could be tens of thousands of those furnaces sold. They're not gonna be very large. They're gonna be very specifically purposed. Eventually they're gonna become standards, if you will, but so companies and OEMs are either trying to push all of their customers into a standard furnace or trying to say, no, we'll design custom one-of-a-kind solutions to problems. But I think you're going to find that the engineering demands of the products are going to drive a change in the type of equipment that people are, are currently have and we'll need in the future. So the answer is yes. I happen to have run pusher furnaces. I like pusher furnaces. Um, uh, I don't see pusher furnaces as a optimum solution for many customers going forward. It's a hard thing for me to say. It's like cutting off your left arm. Sure. <laughs> it's hard to say, but it's true. The, the world is changing. Uh, I will predict something that the world of integral quench furnaces, whether they be batch style in out or whether they be continuous, that world is going to change. I remember seeing my first integral quench furnace, I'm dating myself now, about 1968. And I said, now this is really interesting. This is really cool. And I watched that furnace evolve, if you will, over the last 50 years. And what I've seen now is the fact that companies are looking at possibly hybrid technologies 
an atmosphere carburizing chamber with a high pressure gas quench tank or a vacuum carburizing chamber with an oil, uh, an atmosphere oil quench tank. And the atmosphere is not conventional endothermic gas any longer. The atmosphere is nitrogen. So we don't have, you're going to have, if you, if you have ever walked in, and I'm sure most of our listeners have ever walked down a line of atmosphere furnaces, there's a certain artistic beauty to it. The flames and the, and the heat and the, just the overall aesthetics of it. But that's going to be replaced with a line of furnaces you'd never know were running. Uh, gone are going to be this. Think of the implication. If you as a heat treater could go to your, ins or you as a company, as a corporation, could go to your insurance company, and you could say to them, we have eliminated all flames, all burning in our heat treat department. Think of the impact on your insurance bill, something like that would have. So I'm not, again, knocking any technology. I'm just saying that what we as heat treaters, what your heat treat podcast listeners have to be aware of or become aware of is that in the next 10 or 20 years, the types of furnaces are going to be dramatically changed. Um, uh, I look at the personal computers we had in the 1970s and 1980s versus that, that half a pound laptop I have today or that iPhone or iPad that I'm, I'm using today. I don't wanna leave this to one specific company here. Right. But uh, even though I am a Macintosh user and proud of it, by the way. But the idea being the fact that technology is going to force change. That's the message here. And so, so just to recap what, what you're saying, because I find this very interesting. So you, you are uh, predicting that this is going to be true or not, that furnaces are going to be different in a way. You know, the industry is going to evolve. Uh, you're saying, it might be one piece flow or smaller batch. Hybrid technology, of course, very computerized driven, a lot of IoT and uh, less, uh, uh, more user friendly, like no flames or uh, and on and off. You know, they have to be very flexible. So if, if we could uh, summarize uh, how you, do you envision furnaces to be in 20 years? Let me just say it again, hybrid technologies, one piece flow or smaller batch, right? Very uh, computer driven with IoT and uh, with the ability to uh, uh, on and off, shut it off, turn it out, turn it on. If, 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 I, if I got things right, did yes. I need something? No, you, you've heard it exactly correctly. Uh, the thing that we don't want to delude ourselves with as heat treaters is we don't want to get ourselves into that a delusion that nothing is going to change, that we're going to put a we're going to put a PLC on the furnace and we're going to be happy. Uh, this is change is inevitable. Change happens in life. Change happens in is going to happen in the heat treat industry. Materials are going to fundamentally change. The way in which steel is produced today is fundamentally changing. So we've got we've got uh, specialized mills. We've got uh, uh, custom mills, if you will. We've got mills deciding to manufacture certain products where they have a great deal of expertise. So where we buy or where we get our steel from is changing. All these industries are changing and evolving. Uh, so yes, you've hit it. You've hit it exactly right. Um, I, I will share with you, and I probably shouldn't, but I think our, our listeners will get a kick out of this. Uh, I will share a dream I had in the mid-1970s, where I woke up in a cold sweat one, one uh, late, late, um, well, early morning, let's put it that way. Woke up about two, three o'clock in the morning, because I had this vision of being able to have a furnace without walls. Okay. So I could watch the load 
being run in real time. Now, we may all laugh at that. But of course, when you deal with, for example, nuclear fusion technology, you're looking at magnetic containment because of the temperatures involved. So maybe in the future, we're going to have magnetic containment. We're going to do away with brick and steel. Anyway, that's my vision. That's well, maybe, why everyone knows. Maybe like a, a super glass technology, high heat uh, technology, something like that. I mean, there are planes without uh, the, the are made of, uh, uh, of glass. I don't know if you've seen that they have like a, like a floor made of glass. So I, I can, see, you know, I, I can envision it. I mean, Uh, who's, who, who will be the engineer? I don't know. You know but, but <laughs> well, let's I, put it this way. We're, we're getting a little far afield with that dream. But, but I want people to realize, think outside the box. Sure. Don't, sure. don't think inside the box. Sure. Hey, but Dan, this will be fantastic. You know, I, I, I have really uh, getting a kick out of what you're saying. And I, you know, I have made a bunch of notes. Um, now, going back to the history doctor day to day. Uh, because I love that uh, on, on the on the consultant part, you know, I believe I assume that you get a bunch of calls from heat treaters or guys that they don't know heat treat, but they see that you're the heat treat doctor, and say that they have a, a situation or a problem uh, or something that is going on heat treat related, right? It might be uh, you know uh, distortion or, or dimensional control, as you stated. Uh, maybe it will be a process, maybe industrial engineering or process flow, or maybe uh, they had a quality complaint or a customer recall, I don't know. But what's the method of analysis that you, you use to determine how to solve a problem when dealing with a situation or a problematic? Can you just give us a few examples of why uh, or what's a typical call for you from a customer or, or a request uh, solving a problematic or uh, you know, using your knowledge or your experience to improve a process or to switch technologies or to upgrade it. Can you just uh, sh sh share with us a little bit of what you do and how do you attack the situation? Absolutely, be more than happy to. Uh, I'm probably going to give away a trade secret today. Good. But, but I'm happy to the, do the, This is what the podcast is for. A absolutely. You put me on the spot and I'm, I'm going to tell the truth. Um, you've shined the light on me, so to speak. But the idea being the fact that I've been accused over the years for many, many years now of being basically giving away common sense answers or solutions to problems. And by the way, being well paid for, well paid for it. But the idea being the fact that What people fail to do in most of the calls I receive is they don't start by thinking through the problem. What I always ask someone to do is give me a, a summary, a history of the, of the issue that they're faced with. Give it to me in very general terms. And then as I ask more and more questions, it becomes more and more specific. But whether it's a component part that's failed uh, in a either a critical application or a, a simple uh, a simple application, um, whether it's a um, uh, whether it's a very complicated large company with a lot of heat treat equipment and moving parts, or it's a company with one furnace and one man running the operation. What you deal with when you get a call is you have to understand the problem before you can solve it. And if you remember, there are some very, very basic questions that you want to ask. And those questions are the same questions, by the way, that the ancient Greeks asked years ago. Who, what, why, when, where, how, and by what means, who, what, where, when, why, how, and by what means. So if you basically, as a consultant, when I get a call, 
or I get an email that is saying, I've got a brazing problem. I've got voids being created in the braze joint, or I've got a, a, a different email that comes in that says I'm being audited and I have a, a, a statement in my specifications which be, is being challenged by the auditor. The idea being the fact that you have to understand exactly what the problem or the issue is. And then you have to address it by asking the right questions so that you can then understand what the basic problem is so you can find the root cause. And by the way, for anyone listening, there's only one root cause for every problem. So common sense rules, asking the right questions, understanding the problem, getting the client to think about the issue he's asking is critical to the success of me creating an answer to that question. So there's, there's really not a lot of magic. I wish I could say there was magic dust or being the heat treat doctor, I, I could say, here's a pill. You take this pill and you're gonna become a heat treater in the morning. But what I will say that there are two fundamental types of areas in heat treating that we have to look at. And if heat treaters could control these two areas, they can control their heat treating process. One is the process induced variables or process induced variability temperature is a good example, or there is equipment-induced variability. We talked about that carburizing fan, perhaps not operating it under optimum conditions, if you will. Um, the idea is the fact that if you can control the equipment-induced variability and you can control the process-induced variability, you can control the heat treat process. So when I solve a problem, many times it's to have the or to understand and then have the customer understand where the variability is coming in. Uh, if it's a failure analysis, it's a different issue. But I mean, under a normal heat treat problem, it's understanding where the variability is coming in, and then addressing it, addressing it through controls through maintenance, through the smart application of technology, whatever the solution is. I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but that's what really happens in the process. It's less of the, well, the other thing that happens, of course, is that year after, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you gain more experience mm -hmm. by just being exposed to not 10, one or two or 10 problems, but hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of issues. I remember the first time I was, I was called up by a customer, it was after lunch. He called up and he said, there's a green glaze all over the inside of my integral quench furnace. So the first question I asked him was, how much have you had to drink at lunch? <laughs> now oh, now we fast now that was 1972 we fast forward to 2001 customer calls up and said i've got a green glaze all over the inside of my furnace what does the heat treat doctor say been there done that i said to him what type of washing compound are you using does it have sodium or potassium based nitrates or nitrides? Because what you're experiencing is a sodium based glass. That's the sodium based deposit that's forming a glass at temperature during the heat treat process. The glass is, glass is very viscous, it drips everywhere. It creates all sorts of problems. I've dealt with that problem three times in my career over 50 years, but having seen it, you know how to solve it. 
So experience is the other answer to what's involved. That's why no matter how much a young person wants to come right out of school and go into consulting, it's challenging because he doesn't have the knowledge base of practical experience. And I believe where the, the consultant area, you know, when, when you're hiring a consultant, you're hiring experience, right? So that's why it's very hard for a young guy to, to be a consultant. It's not impossible, but you know, the, you, you have had many rodeos then. So, and, and by mixing uh, your experience with this methodology that you just uh, shared with us, the basic questions, what, where, when, how, and, and, and the others, you know, and having you seen some similarities on different problems or applications, you can have a theory or maybe like uh, you, you, can, you can narrow the problem to a couple of scenarios where you have had the pre previous experience, right? And I believe that's, uh, that, that's very valuable, you know, being on different applications and actually uh, asking the customer, you know, help me understand what's the background, give me the whole story because there's no magic pill. Uh, another question, what is the most common mistake that uh, you see that all the guys that uh, are calling you or have a situation uh, they make and that can be easily solved? Well, the, the first one is, and we all as human beings fall into this one. The first is that we try to do everything ourselves without asking for help, without going out and asking questions. Mm -hmm. And we try to do it ourselves and we finally discover we, we just don't have enough knowledge or information or skill to do a particular task. So we ask the person next to us, we ask other people in the industry. Um, so the biggest issue that I see is that we don't do enough networking as a, as a industry or as a society. You know, there are various technical societies. Uh, I'll, I'll pay you a compliment with these heat treat podcasts. You're getting knowledge and information out to people. So whatever it's called, if you will, knowledge and information is freely flowing to the community. People can find answers, and if not answers to que specific questions, directions in which to look. So a lot of the, uh, what I see is people failing to ask for help. And then the, the second most common problem is the fact that we as human beings are inherently stubborn. So a guy calls up and he says, well, I've tried to heat treat it five times and it hasn't worked. And I think of Einstein's famous line about the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over again and trying to get a different and result. Expecting getting a different result, right? Exactly. So, uh, but the most common problem is the fact that they have tried to solve the problem without understanding the root cause of the problem. They, they've tried methods and techniques and put a lot of time and effort into something. Most people that contact me are at their wits end. They're frustrated because they've got problems that seem insurmountable because what they've done is they've taken a grain of sand and they've made it into a mountain of sand and they can no longer climb the mountain. But the idea is the fact that they try to do too much with too little knowledge. So those are the most common mistakes. There, there are many others and there sure. are many different things, but those are the most common ones that I run into. That, are, you know, like you're saying, just, com just common sense and, you know, uh, don't drain yourself on a, on a glass of water. You know, I, you know, I love that. So th thanks for sharing this, Dan. I, I, this podcast has been very interesting. Um, before the closing of the show, would you like to add something else? Did we miss something uh, that is worth sharing with the audience regarding uh, where the industry is going or how to solve uh, specific situations on the furnace industry? Well, let me, let me relate from my own experience to, to maybe answer that question. Uh, I think it's a great question, by the way. Uh, 
but if I was able uh, uh, to turn back the clock, if you will, or go back in a time capsule and talk to my younger self, sure. as the phrase goes, um, I would say to that person, um, yes, I see you're, you're fairly bright, you're very inquisitive, uh, you ask a lot of questions, but share the knowledge that you're learning. Okay, share it with as many people as often as you possibly can. You know, before the podcast began, we were talking about the, uh, the name, the heat treat doctor, and how the brand has seemed to um, have a life of its own, if you will. Well, part of the reason for that is the fact that I've written so many articles. I've written, I've given so many technical presentations. I've given thousands of seminars and webinars and, and lectures. I've written seven books. I've actually written 10, but seven of them in the field of heat treating. Um, I've written thousands, uh, maybe not a thousand. I think it's 900 and some technical articles. Now. Almost, almost a thousand. Almost a thousand, but it's, it's not about me. What it's about is sharing knowledge. You know, we don't want to give away trade secrets. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying put your designs out there on the internet for everyone to share. But we can help people by sharing our collective experience and having people learn from the mistakes of others. The, the old comment about standing on the shoulders of others to get taller than yourself. The, the idea is the fact that pioneers such as myself didn't always have the right tools. We didn't have always the right time or talent, but we learned through a series of mistakes. I remember when I left the R&D lab in Lindbergh, they actually cheered because I had broken and fixed every piece of equipment in that lab multiple, multiple times. I had rewired furnaces. I, anyway, the idea being the fact that we as an industry need to talk to one another and we need to share. And in one way, the internet has made this easier and faster. But we as human beings have to overcome this idea of just acquiring knowledge for our own sake and not sharing it with others. So that's what the heat treat doctor has learned, if you will, that everything is on the table. We have to share everything. We have to share our experiences, share our knowledge. And then the, the youngsters in the group, whether they be 12 years old or whether they be 72 years old, all learn, all grow, all prosper. That, that's my advice. Thank you so much. And as, uh, as, as the Hitri doctor said, you know, we need to share our knowledge. Uh, we, need three, we need more Hitri doctors, but I will call them, we need uh, Hitri uh, professors and teachers. For, for, uh, we need as well more uh, Hitri mentors, I would say. So, uh, so yeah, th thanks for sharing that. Uh, Dan, I would like to thank you very much for being here and sharing all your knowledge. Uh, you're a very passionate individual when it comes to hatred. We need more, more people like you to make our industry better, to make the world better, because that's what we do um, to, uh, as, as, as people in the industry to make this world a better place. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it was great having you here. Just would like to, to, to uh, say to the audience before we, we say goodbye, Dan, don't worry, uh, that we're uh, uploading weekly podcasts with experts, power players on the industry, sharing the knowledge like the Hitri doctor just did with you guys. We're on Spotify, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube under the Hitri channel. Please subscribe, like the video, and uh, let's hear some of the goodbye words from the Hitri doctor, Dan. Carlos, I was just going to say, keep up the good work. Uh, and, and I will say that it's all about loving what you do. Yes. If you're in the heat treat industry for more than five years, you're in it for life. But don't look at it as a life sentence. Look at it as constant growth and learning. It's a passion that some of us share and hopefully the world will learn to share. Uh, thank you again. Love talking.
You say you hear it from the Heat Doctor on the Heat Podcast.